Hi everyone, welcome back from spring break. Um, I'm sorry I can't be here today and you have a guest teacher, but I wanted to talk through um, and work through some of the practice problems on the videos that you watch. So ionic bonding and covalent bonding, I wanted to help you out with your in-class practice. So you should have a handout to do these practice problems that we're gonna work through in this video. Just looking ahead at this week, if you need to come in for office hours, here's my availability. I should be back tomorrow if um, anything comes up where I'm for whatever reason not going to be back, I will send you a message through Canvas, um, but otherwise I'll be here ready at 7.15 if you have any questions for me or you need some help. You should already have our problem set sheet for the unit. You got that before spring break, but here it is again, just the breakdown of the different objectives. And some reminders before we get rolling. So objective number one, which is mostly about um, identifying types of bonds, ionic, polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, and then with an emphasis on ionic bonding, that's due Wednesday. You should be also working on your mock exam review assignment, those multiple choice and FRQs. Um, that's due Friday, April 14th. Um, that's also the day of the mock exam. And then it says atomic structure square root curve. Obviously I have not graded those tests yet. So as soon as those are graded, you can start working on the square root curve corrections. All right, let's jump right in. So objective one is bonding basics and ionic bonding. We're gonna do some practice together. All right, this was in your first video, but just to recap, an ionic bond typically happens between a metal and a non-metal element, okay? The metal um, has a positive charge, the non-metal has a negative charge, and they attract. Um, the reason that the metal has a positive charge is because it's giving away electrons, the non-metal takes those electrons, and then when we have positive and negative, they're gonna attract each other in the form of an ionic bond. One thing to note is we could have a polyatomic ion as one of those things, so replace the metal or replace the non-metal because a polyatomic ion is just a group of atoms with a charge. Obviously, once these are bonded together, though, um, the ionic bond appears neutral because the positive and the negatives will cancel out. A covalent bond is going to happen between a non-metal element with another non-metal element, so above that metalloid staircase, and metallic is obviously metal, so we're looking at like all of, um, for example, like copper atoms all together or different types of metals with other metals. These were in your um, video, so I'm not going to read this to you. You already have these notes um, from your videos. But one thing I wanted to point out is when we have ionic bonding between a metal, when it gives away its electron to the non-metal, which takes the electron, um, that's how the bond forms between the positive and negative. If we were to draw a Lewis dot structure for ionic bonding, it looks slightly different. It has two parts. It, one part is showing the transfer. So sodium has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. I'm showing that this one electron can go to the empty spot on chlorine and then my final bonded structure is sodium without that dot with a positive charge chlorine in brackets with all eight dots and a minus charge and we know that positive and negative attract so the Lewis structures look slightly different for ionic bonding Covalent bonding happens between two non-metals, so like hydrogen with carbon, hydrogen with nitrogen, doesn't always have to be hydrogen, those are just the examples. And those Lewis structures you practice drawing in the second video, those also, those look slightly different because we have our lines to represent the bond. So we'll look at some of those today too. And lastly, the newest one for us is the metallic bonding. Um, so that's talking about just metals in general, um, bonding with other metals or bonding with themselves, like how does sodium attract other sodium or zinc attract other zinc. But the big thing we need to know about is this sea of electrons um, kind of surrounding all of those metals. All right, so we're gonna go back to periodic trends and look at electronegativity, which is the atom's ability to attract a shared electron. If we have two um, atoms that are the same or nearly the same in electronegativity, um, we say that the electrons are, have equal sharing of electrons and that's nonpolar. The way I remember is that my mom is not a polar bear when my brother and I share equally. So my mom does not act like a polar bear when we share equal and nice. If I have two atoms with different electronegativities, um, we are going to have polar, which means unequal sharing of electrons between the bonds or within the bond. And then if we have um, a huge, huge difference in electronegativity where there's no sharing at all, that's an ionic bond, that's a transfer. It's like, give me that electron and one atom takes it, the other is like, okay, sad day, um, and that's it. So to help figure that out, we can look at electronegativity charts. You have one in your book, um, but what we'll do, let's say that, for example, oxygen is bonded to nitrogen. I would take the electronegativity of oxygen minus the electronegativity of nitrogen. The difference gives me the idea of if we have equal sharing, unequal sharing, um, or a full transfer. 
All right, so it says without using figure 8.3, this is objective one, number 34, so helping you out with your um, problem set. But they're basically saying without using the chart that I just showed you, predict which bond in each of the following groups will be the most polar. So out of these three, C to H, SI to H, or SN to H, which one would be the most polar? Here's the idea. If I can't actually look up the numbers, we know that atoms with the biggest difference in electronegativity is going to be the most polar. So how do I figure that out? Well, I'm going to look for the elements that are farthest away from each other on the periodic table. So if all of these have hydrogen involved, who is going to be the farthest away from hydrogen? If all, for letter B, all of them have bromine, which of the first atom is farthest away from bromine? Because that will result in the largest difference in electronegativity. Pause the video for me and I want you to try A, B, C, and D. All right, so here's the idea. What I did for each element, so I didn't include hydrogen, right, because I am looking at the ones bonded to hydrogen. I looked at what row they're in, and then if there was a tie for row, then I looked at protons, just like we do with periodic trends. But what I notice is that Sn compared to H has the biggest distance so meaning the tin SN is farthest away from H. So we would expect the largest difference in electronegativity. What I did just as a check is I actually subtracted, for example, carbon minus hydrogen, SI minus hydrogen, and SN minus hydrogen. And I'm showing those down here, but they told me explicitly to not use the chart. So I'm only basing it off of who's the farthest away because that should be the biggest difference in electronegativity. On the next one, um, so again, even though SN is a 0.3 difference, with H compared to carbon, um, my answer is going to be SNH because in theory I wasn't looking at these numbers. Okay, now we're comparing aluminum, gallium, indium, and thallium with um, the location for bromine. I look at what row they're in. Who's the farthest away from bromine? Well, because bromine is in the fourth row, the one that's going to be farthest away is the aluminum in terms of location. Okay, um, we're comparing carbon and silicon with oxygen. Look at the rows. Silicon is farthest away from oxygen compared to carbon, who's in the same um, row as oxygen. And then O to F or O to Cl. Um, so again, we're comparing to oxygen, F, and then Cl. One thing I know is that F is the most electronegative element. So when F is with anything, um, that's going to be the biggest difference in electronegativity because F is the largest in electronegativity as a single element. Okay, if you look at the differences, I don't see a difference numerically, but again, they're telling us not to look at those numbers they just want to base it off the periodic trend so who's farthest away that's going to result in the biggest difference all right objective number one number 38 this is some of the problem you'll have to do the rest of it as well for your problem set but indicate the bond polarity, meaning is it polar or nonpolar? Show the partial positive and negative charges. So remember, here's the symbol partial positive or partial negative, or you could do a dipole arrow like this. Okay, and that would only be if we have a polar bond. You're not going to do those if it is um, a nonpolar bond. And so what I would like you to do is you're going to find, using your chart, find these elements, look up the electronegativity of each one, subtract to find the difference, and decide if it's in the nonpolar range, which is 0 to 0.4, the polar range, which is 0.5 to like 1.6-ish, and then if it's ionic, it would be 1.6 or higher when you subtract the electronegativities. Try on your own. And I'll put the answers up in two, one. All right, so the first one, carbon is 2.5, oxygen is 3.0. That gives me a difference of 1.0. So this is a polar bond. How do I decide who gets the positive and the negative, or if you like these symbols, partial positive, partial negative? Well, the way I decide is I look, the one that's more electronegative, 3.5 is larger than 2.5, that's the one that's pulling the electrons towards itself, so that gets the partial negative since electrons are negative. So because it's polar and oxygen has a bigger electronegativity, it's the partial negative. On the next one, um, 3.0 minus 2.1, I get 0.9, that is also a polar bond. And in this case, because chlorine has a larger electronegativity, it is the partial negative. On this guy, I get a difference of 0.7. Bromine is the more electronegative, so it gets the partial negative sign. All right, same thing, objective one, um, number 39, or sum of number 39. You're going to look at these two elements in each pair and decide, based off electronegativities, if they're ionic, nonpolar covalent, or polar covalent. I would also look at the types. Are they nonmetals, metals, things like that? All right, for this first one, I did not have to look at electronegativities because rubidium is a metal. It's under the metalloid staircase. Chlorine is a nonmetal. It's above the metalloid staircase on my periodic table. And when I have a metal with a nonmetal, we are going to be ionic. 
Um, for letter C, so we skip B, you'll have to do that on your problem set. Um, I have carbon with fluorine, both are non-metals, so I look at the electronegativity, 2.5 and 4.0. When I subtract those, I get a difference of 1.5, which falls right at the top of the polar covalent. It, it almost looks ionic, but again, my other clue is non-metal with non-metal. So we're looking at all of the evidence when we're deciding these things. And then lastly, barium is under the staircase, sulfur is above the staircase, metal and non-metal is going to be ionic. All right, that was kind of identifying just in general. Are we ionic? Are we covalent? And then if we are covalent, are we polar or non-polar? Let's focus more on ionic bonding. Um, so you have this information from your video, but again, ionic bonding is very closely related to the amount of valence electrons because all the elements want to have eight. So metals typically give away their electrons so that they can have a full outer shell and non-metals typically take electrons when we're looking at ionic bonds. Okay, the charges will come in handy when we are deciding the ratio um, that the elements will bond to create a neutral compound. All right, part of ionic bonding is remembering how to write names and formulas for ionic compounds, so making sure they are neutral um, and then using the right rules if we're going from the formula to the name. So I want you to pause the video and let's test our memory on how to write formulas for A, B, and C and writing names for D, E, and F. All right, the first one, magnesium nitride. When I see something end with "-ide", most of the time, that just means a non-metal on the periodic table. There are two exceptions, cyanide and hydroxide that are polyatomics that we have to be aware of. But when I see I'd, my instinct is to look at my periodic table. When I find magnesium on my periodic table, I see that it typically forms a plus two charge. Nitride is just regular non-metal nitrogen and it forms a minus three charge. What I teach in regular chem, this three goes down to magnesium, we lose the minus sign right here. This two goes to nitrogen, we lose the plus sign right here as subscripts. But what that really means is we need three magnesiums and two nitrogens in order to make this compound neutral in charge. The next one, magnesium nitrate. When I see 8-8 eight, eight or ite-ite, eight, eight, I'm thinking of my polyatomic ions that I have memorized. Magnesium is still a plus two, but nitrate is a polyatomic NO3 with a negative one. So the formula is capital N, capital O, little three, and the charge is minus one. When I go to crisscross those charges, the one goes to magnesium, we don't write it. The two goes outside of the parentheses of the polyatomic. So I need two nitrates to cancel out one magnesium. Iron three carbonate. 8-8 eight, eight is a polyatomic. When I look at iron on my periodic table, I do not know the charge. This 3 is the charge of iron that we are going to use to make the compound. Carbonate is CO3 with a minus 2. So this 3 is important. It's not how many irons there are. It is the charge of iron. When I crisscross, this 3 goes to carbonate. The 2 goes to Fe. So that's where these subscripts are coming from. Okay, now we're going the other way. So metals keep their name. So lithium, non-metals chain. We drop the ending and add I to lithium oxide. Okay, um, metal potassium keeps its name. NO3 is a polyatomic. It also keeps its name, so just potassium nitrate. And then silver is a metal, so it keeps its name. Silver and then nitrogen, we drop the ending and add ide. So silver nitride. The only thing that you might have to do is if it is one of those transition metals besides zinc or silver or cadmium, zinc is always plus two, silver is plus one, cadmium plus two. Um, but if it's any of those other transition metals, you would have to add your own Roman numerals to indicate what the charge was. All right, with ionic compounds, we want to know how strong those compounds are held together, and we're going to look at lattice energy to, to do that. Lattice energy is related to columbic attraction, but we're relating the positive and negative charge ions in the ionic compound with also the size of those ions, okay? So essentially what we're asking when we, can, when we ask about more exothermic lattice energy, I'm saying which ionic compound has the strongest attraction between the positive and negative ions. So here's an example in objective one for sum of number 60. You'll have to do the rest, but we're going to do A, C, and D right now. All right, here's the idea. So we are looking at lattice energy. Um, we're looking at the charges, and then we're looking at the distance. Here's how I approach this. We're going to look at LIF versus CSF first. The first thing I'm going to look at is the charges. So I see here Li is plus 1, F is minus 1, CS is plus 1, F is minus 1. If those are the same, we are then going to look at the size of the ions. We know F minus is going to be the same size for both. So I'm really comparing lithium and cesium. 
lithium is in the second energy level in the second row of my periodic table cesium is in the six what i notice then is because lithium is smaller in atomic radius it's in the second row um, that ion can get closer to the f and so that's going to cause more attraction so lif has a more exothermic lattice energy because li1 plus is smaller than cs1 plus so the distance or the radius is smaller on this problem set i need you to justify your answer showing work like this and showing a little bullet point like i have um, letter C, BaCl2 versus BaO. If we look at the charges, Ba is plus 2, Cl is minus 1, Ba is still plus 2, O is minus 2. Once we have a difference in those charges, we can decide on the answer. That's what's going to dominate. So BaO has a more exothermic lattice energy because the anion charge is bigger in magnitude. So negative 2 is bigger than negative 1. So we're going to result in a more exothermic lattice energy. Okay, and then lastly, Na2SO4 versus CaSO4, looking at charges, plus 1 minus minus two plus two minus two i see more magnitude of charge here so caso4 because of the larger cation energy hopefully that helps with the rest on your problem set for that problem all right, moving on to some in-class practice for objective two on covalent bonding more specifically lewis dot structures these are the same steps you saw in the video, so I'm not going to rehash those we're just going to jump right into practicing but if you did not watch the covalent bonding video you should and then here are some tips and tricks when you're drawing covalent um, bonding Lewis dot structures, again in that earlier video. All right. For objective two, number 120 and 124, um, there's two problems kind of related. So first it says predict the molecular structure, that's Vesper, including bond angles. Okay, today we're just gonna draw the Lewis dot structure. I will teach you Vesper tomorrow when I am back. Um, so you'll be able to go back and add, but to start, we need to draw the Lewis dot structure. And then 124 says, which of the molecules have a dipole moment, meaning are they polar? Okay, so let's take a look together. All right, PCl3 has 26 electrons, so what I did is I started with P in the middle, the three chlorines. I did single bonds, those hold two. Oh, sorry, the 26 comes from um, one phosphorus with five valence plus three chlorine, each was seven. So five plus 21 is how I got 26. Anyways, I connect with single bonds. That uses two, four, six, so I'm down to 20. I fill the outer, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. That used 18 of my 20, so I have two left in my piggy bank. I put them on my center. Okay, here's what I know. When I look on my list, phosphorus has 2.2, chlorine has 3.0, so each bond has an electronegativity difference of 0.8, which is each bond is polar. So then we look at the overall shape of the molecule. You'll learn tomorrow it's called trigonal pyramid and these are the bond angles. Um, but because the shape is not symmetrical, we have a dipole moment and it is a polar molecule. Okay, so we could put partial negatives and partial positives or we could draw an arrow in general, the shape of the um, molecule. Okay, for SCL2, I have 20 electrons, so I start with my S in the middle, my chlorines, single bond uses 2, 4, fill the outer, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, so I've used um, 16 so far, that means I have 4 left, I put them on my center, okay, if I look at my electronegativities, chlorine is 3.0, sulfur is 2.5, so that is a polar bond when I subtract, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and the shape is called bent, which means these are not going to cancel, it is okay if you drew like this, so I kind of drew mine as a bent shape. If you drew yours like this, that is fine, but the true shape that it will make is actually bent. Okay, so even though this looks like this guy might cancel and this guy might cancel, the lone pairs will actually take up room on top and kind of squish these down. So once we learn more about these geometries, that will help you see that these bonds, these polar bonds won't cancel, it's not symmetrical. Okay, last one, SIF4 has 32 electrons. So here's my Lewis structure. This shape is tetrahedral. When I subtract fluorine minus sulfur, I get a difference of 1.5. So each bond in this molecule is polar, but because of the geometry being what's called tetrahedral, this one's canceled by this one, this guy gets canceled by this guy. So we have polar bonds, but the molecule is said to be nonpolar because those polar bonds cancel each other out. All right, objective two, number 102, um, we are going to draw Lewis dot structures for all of these, okay? Um, a hint for the first one, the, these two H's are bonded to the N, then an O, then an H. So it's kind of trying to give you a hint on the order since it's more of like a long line structure versus one thing in the middle. Okay, here are the full answers, but I'm going to go through one at a time. 
um, to help us out, but you can see I'm looking at bond length. So we're thinking the difference over nitrogen to oxygen, we're looking at is it a single bond? Is it a single bond, triple bond? Is it a double bond or is it resonance, right? Things like that. Okay, for the first one, they told me these two H's go to the N, and then the O, then the H was the hint. Okay, um, so I have 14 electrons. So I first started with my single bond, so that used two, four, six, eight. My hydrogens are good. I don't need any lone pairs. So that means in my um, piggy bank, I had six left. So I put two on nitrogen, and then the four electrons or two lone pairs on oxygen so everyone has a complete octet this is a single bond remember single bonds are the longest if you were to add up oops excuse me all right n2 to o so i have n to n and then here's my o 16 electrons in this molecule sorry about that 16 electrons in this molecule um and so what I end up getting is I'm going to not have enough to give all of these guys lone pairs. So we're going to end up with a triple bond. Um, so one year, a kid, just because there was no hint. So if we do this guy, fill the outer. That used 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 of my electrons, but my nitrogen in the middle is not satisfied. Okay, what I ended up doing was I erased these two and do a bond here, and then I also took from this guy, but technically we could also, as resonance, do this, erase those, and do two double bonds. Okay, but what we'll see is it when if Sorry about that. If we were to add up formal charges, um, this structure would be better. So we're looking at a triple bond, which is short, shorter, um, I should say. All right, N to O, you should get a triple bond. Don't forget if there's a charge, we got to put that Lewis structure in brackets with the charge on the outside. So that's a short. And then NO2 minus, we actually have a resonance structure. Um, so what ends up happening is in order to satisfy the octet, we got to erase two and do a double bond. But it doesn't matter if you do the double bond on the left or on the right. So really what we're happening here is the bond length is more like 1.5 because it's gonna be an average. We have a double and a single, and a single and a double, so to average, it's more like one and a half. So it's slightly shorter than a single bond would be, um, but slightly longer than a double bond would be. Here's your NO3 minus with resonance. So again, this guy is more of like a 1.33, because we have one double bond and two single bonds. So this one is closer to the length of the long single bond, but it's slightly shorter than just something with a, only a single bond because we have this double bond um, that rotates around it in the form of resonance. All right, you should also have this kind of summary chart. This is kind of a good place to start as, as you're studying and looking at the differences. Here's the second page of that. All right, the last thing I wanted to talk about today is that we are in the home stretch. You have already done 26 problem sets this year, 15 labs, six quizzes, eight summatives. You have done a lot and we are nearing the end. All we have left are four more problem sets, two to three labs, I'm thinking more two, but we'll kind of see where we land, two more quizzes and one more summative this semester. It's definitely a good feeling when you can put it all on one slide. Um, hopefully you see the end in sight as well. So we have problem sets for bonding, one, two, and three. We have a quiz, an interim lab, and then a summative for our bonding unit. For gas laws, we have a problem set that we're gonna do together in class. It won't be turned in. And then um, one problem set that you'll do actually like you do your normal problem sets. I'll get you that date soon. And then the third problem set is another one that we do together in class as practice, so not do an interim lab and then an interim quiz. We have our atomic structure square root curve once that test is graded and once you take the bonding test, that square root curve. Your mock exam is your final exam, um, but the review guide is due the day of the final. If you do all of the review, then you can square root curve your mock and the real deal exam is May 1st. Okay. In addition to the mock exam as your final, you will also teach a mini lesson, more info to come on that as we're reviewing, um, but that will be part of your final exam grade. So we are almost there. All we have left fits on one side. What a great feeling. You guys are killing it. Let's keep, keep going and finish strong.